I have a rule about being constructive, so I can't ask any questions right now because all of the questions that I have right now are rhetorical and they end with the word idiot. The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life, it's episode 348. We're into September now of 2023. I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about this week. And as always, so many things we can't talk about on the first and only wrestling podcast. Um, chronologically, if we were to go here, we should probably begin with WWE's pay-per-view last weekend. Um, but uh, CM Punk. <laughs> <laughs> Look, allow us to go out of order to to, to celebrate our one last week <laughs> with, well, with Phil for the time being. I guess he was technically fired before the WWE pay-per-view uh, because it came out like uh, an hour before. But uh, yeah, AEW fired CM Punk for cause in their very carefully crafted legal statement. Tony Khan feared for his life. Mm-hmm. Uh, a report came out in the Observer last week that CM Punk had lunged at Tony Khan backstage mm-hmm. um, somewhere around his altercation with Jack Perry backstage. And this led to CM Punk being terminated. And they believe that they have this incident on video, and they believe they have a pretty airtight case. Otherwise, they wouldn't have uh, terminated terminated Phil for cause. And so, um, thus ends this chapter of the <laughs> Phil Brooks AEW saga. What a ride! Uh... Yeah, I guess even even with all of what you've just laid out, assuming that is all uh, true, uh, which you know, punks can't pretty uh, pretty aggressive about pushing back on things that they think aren't true. Over the last few weeks, didn't push back on the claim uh, that he lunged at Tony Khan. Uh, so uh, we'll see. Uh, who knows? But uh, I thought maybe they would still work out a deal to pay him to stay home under the or at least get him to sign an NDA and pay him some money to go away because that it could it could get messy again (laughs) if Phil is is not under a legal gag order (laughs) to speak about this I don't know if he would given that the last time he uh, aired his grievances. He ended up in a court of law for several years and spent a lot of his hard-earned dollars defending his uh, good name. Um, yeah, I don't, uh, I, I don't know if he would, but yeah, he's he's been fired. We don't know if there's any kind of can they can if you're firing someone with cause, can you still enforce some kind of no compete? Could he be? on raw next week if you wanted to i don't uh, i don't really know i don't i wouldn't be able to understand that uh that side of things but uh it certainly does speculate what it would be like if he did uh go back to wwe after all of this i suppose that's the next round of uh of uh of, of fantasy booking uh of this of this program between punk and AEW is punk going back to wwe i'd just like to lay out Phil's AEW tenure here mm-hmm. very quickly. Um, and apparently this has uh, been floating around uh, social media the last couple of days. Uh, apparently Brian Alvarez compiled this on the uh, Wrestling Observer board. So I can't take credit for uh, for the timeline here, but oh, Brian wrote so, something? <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> All right. Uh, CM Punk this uh this timeline ignores his initial uh showing up in AEW and having like one of the greatest television wrestling segments of all time in his mm-hmm. return but uh CM Punk confronts William Regal regarding being a stooge for Triple H <laughs> <laughs> uh 
All right. Yep. That uh, that story finally came out this week that uh, he and uh, William Regal had a not pleasant interaction. Um, it was never really specified where, but I think it happened at a WrestleCon <laughs> or oh. like a, a convention. It wasn't like backstage at AEW. It was like at a convention. Um, okay, back to his timeline. CM Punk threatens to hold up a pay-per-view with Hangman Page because he feared for his safety. <laughs> CM Punk calls out Hangman on live TV with no intention of a program between them. CM Punk sends a legal letter to AEW regarding working with Moxley in a Rocky-style feud and possibly being cleared. He sent a legal letter because they were trying to make it work, even though he wasn't medically cleared. I don't blame him for that one. CM Punk verbally abuses management and anyone in his path at the All Out press conference. <laughs> CM Punk physically abuses management in Brawl Out. CM Punk leaks stories on Brawl Out, saying, quote, Door was kicked down. Larry's teeth were knocked loose. Ace Steel's wife was in danger. CM Punk cited Illinois Castle Doctrine Law. <laughs> right. CM Punk <laughs> posts on Instagram calling out Dave Meltzer, calling him a liar, and Chris Jericho calling Jericho a liar and a stooge, and John Moxley for having seen Rocky movies. CM Punk pokes around WWE to see if there's interest despite being under contract with AEW. <laughs> CM Punk shows up at a WWE show, making sure he is seen backstage before being asked to leave. CM Punk is pulled from the collision announcement at the last minute at the uh, Warner Media upfronts due to Punk refusing to show up for f filming the vignettes and quote unquote played a card last minute. All right, I'm not sure what that means. Uh, CM Punk gets a steal his job back with back pay. CM Punk returns and makes a counterfeit Bucks comment on live TV. Mm -hmm. CM Punk confronts Ryan Nemeth regarding a Twitter post. <laughs> <laughs> CM Punk does an interview that doesn't uh, with ESPN that doesn't publish uh, everything that he said. Oh, interesting. CM Punk sends Christopher Daniels, head of talent relations, home from Collision. <laughs> CM Punk bans Matt Hardy and Isaiah Cassidy from Collision. <laughs> C CM Punk wants to get into the blood and guts match. <laughs> CM Punk tells CM Punk tells Jungle Boy he can't use real glass. CM Punk tries to get on the Zoom calls between FTR and the Young Bucks. <laughs> CM Punk sends Ryan Nemeth home from collision. CM Punk may or may not have wanted Hangman Page backstage. CM Punk cuts a, cu cuts a post show promo on Hangman Page about not moving action figures. <laughs> CM Punk <laughs> tried to arrange a meeting between the elite that they did not want. <laughs> CM Punk scuffles with jungle boy after comments during a match cm punk quote unquote lunges at tony khan and makes him quote unquote fear for his life cm punk is terminated with cause quite a run <laughs> quite a run you can't say it wasn't a uh <laughs> he didn't get a lot done you know <laughs> he was a busy guy during these these almost exactly two years <laughs> that he was there uh yeah, when you lay it all that la out like that, especially because like the last 15 things you said happened in the last two months. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's really uh, what a what a journey and what a story of a guy who I think, depending on who you asked um, after the, the first fight uh, brawl out 2022, um, not to be confused with brawl in 2023. uh it feels like this is my personal read of it. I maybe this is not true. Feels like a guy who didn't want to come back, <laughs> who was hoping to be paid to go away. Um, and obviously, as you mentioned, inquired about work elsewhere in the event that he was paid <laughs> to go away. And when he didn't get that, he either decided to. Well, either I'm coming back and getting every single thing I want and nothing I don't. Or I will make them get rid of me this time. <laughs> That's what it feels like. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm not. And again, as we've said time and time again, I think Phil had some very legitimate gripes at times over the past two years. 
Um, I think a lot of this lays at the feet ultimately of the guy who's supposedly in charge of the whole company. Uh, that being Tony Khan, obviously, but uh, it felt like this whole last few months was a, uh, how much rope are they going to give me? How far can I go? I'm just going to keep pushing it and pushing it and pushing it either because he wanted to leave or because he didn't care if he did get fired. That's that's kind of my read when you lay it all out like that, especially especially the, you know, whatever we are, June to, to, to last last Saturday evening when he was announced that it was he was fired with cause. Sure. Um, as number one, Tony Khan hater, this pains me to say, but uh, I thought Tony, what Tony did in uh, addressing this on television and specifically addressing this in front of the live crowd in Chicago before last Saturday's collision taping. I thought it took balls. I thought it took guts. I thought it was absolutely the right thing to do in terms of the way he chose to address the crowd. And uh, good for him. Yeah, I mean, he he chose to go out there in in CM Punk's hometown and 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 speak before the crowd. He could have just played the video. Um he could have waited until Monday <laughs> to announce that he was firing the guy. Um, but yeah, so I do give him a, a modicum of, uh, of respect for that, for not doing a very carny thing and trying to sell tickets and or pay-per-views off of a, we don't know. We don't know what's going to happen type of uh, type of vibe going on with that show. Yeah. So he he chose a non carny route. Um, now, again, when issues between Punk and the Elite were raised before the first backstage fist fight, uh, he his response was, well, Brett and Sean didn't really get along, did they? And so for that reason, I do blame him <laughs> and I don't want to give him <laughs> too much credit. But as a you know, as a result of all of this, I would say. Yes, given the circumstances and what he chose to do, he he did something he didn't have to do. And I assume he I mean, he knew he was going to get booed, I would have to assume when he announced it. So, yeah, he could have just played the pre-tape. He could have just not announced it at all in the building. Um, Obviously, it probably would have gotten out because everybody has a phone. But uh, but yeah, he could have he could have played this in a safer way for himself and he chose not to. So, um, yeah, um, I guess the other, other thing on the, on the Tony side is what was different this time? Is it just cause there was footage? <laughs> is it because he personally was potentially in the line of fire, so to speak? Um, you know, as of like two months ago, he was chanting punk's name backstage allegedly. So, <laughs> Um, I guess I wonder what the uh, if it's just being an eyewitness to it changed his uh, his view on the whole situation as uh, as something that could be managed. Uh, hard to say. Well, we probably won't know unless unless there's a lawsuit <laughs> and the transcripts are released publicly. Right. Well, to your point, he went from catering to the guy's every whim, mm-hmm. giving him his own television show with his own roster giving him if punk wasn't booking collision. And I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that if he wasn't booking it, he was at least very hands-on about it and helping to produce it. A la Um, how like Hogan is in Bischoff's office. (laughs) Right. That kind of deal. Yeah. I don't think he's there writing like, uh, you know, a Diamante promo or something, (laughs) but he went from that to firing the guy. Uh, in, in a week, so <laughs> like, yeah, I'm, I don't, I don't know. Maybe it's just that it was on video. Maybe it's just like uh, he knew he knew he was going to have a mutiny if he didn't do something. I don't know. Um, I don't know how to do the CM Punk eulogy. He came back with one of the great with more goodwill, yeah, and um in one of the great television wrestling segments of all time. Mm-hmm. And two years later, he's going home, uh, run out of a company. <laughs> Jungle Jack Perry claims the 
claims the runoff, <laughs> I suppose. What do you know? What do you know about that? And then uh, Ace Steel uh, was released <laughs> by AEW this week. So there's that, too. I'm sure that'll be a fun, uh, <laughs> enjoyable, just a fun wrinkle and twist to all of this. Is Ace Steel, <laughs> Human Cannibal, <laughs> released. Hey, hey, thanks for coming to our office. Um, we're, we're gonna have to let you go uh, on, on account of we remembered you bit a guy last year, <laughs> and uh, it turns out there's a strict no biting policy. Uh, so one strike, you're out. I'm afraid. So you know our hands are tied. It's in the handbook. So also, we're not sure what you do here. <laughs> you Skype in to collision. I I don't know. I suppose. Um. In Tony Khan's statement, he mentioned that he, uh, in the written statement, he mentioned that CM Punk is being released from his contracts. That's interesting, too. Uh, contracts, plural, meaning he had a uh, he had a, a talent contract. And I'm assuming a producer's contract, which I'm assuming made him an, an employee and not an independent contractor. And I'm assuming it meant that he had like uh, health insurance. And mm-hmm. things like that. And, um, you know, for Mr. <laughs> by the boys, <laughs> for the boys, <laughs> workers' rights, I'm one of the boys. Mm-hmm. The boys should be unionized. And, uh, well, look at that. <laughs> uh, he's a man of... Uh, <laughs> he's always been a man who's held several conflicting viewpoints at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the other thing, reading it back. It's like uh, Hangman going in his into business for himself on TV, bad. Punk doing it. Okay. Justified. Yes. Retaliatory. Yes. Only did it. He was forced to. Yes. Um, you know, people, uh, you know, uh, yeah. It's just, there's always a reason, uh, you know. Wants wants to work with the uh, wants to work with the elite. Doesn't like people taking pot shots online or or on television. Um, uh, gets uh, then then cuts a promo on Adam Page's action figures not selling. You know, yeah. Uh, or or the Bucks are, are counterfeit or whatever. Gets in Ryan Nemeth's face. <laughs> I mean, you had me there for a minute because you're like, okay, when you're being a when you're being a jerk to to young Jungle Boy, you're like, well, nobody, I've never heard anyone say any bad things about Jungle Boy as a person. But then you're like, well, he's banning Matt Hardy and Ryan Nemitz. You're like, okay, maybe maybe he's all right. <laughs> maybe he's got a point here. Maybe he's, maybe his uh, his radar's not so off. Maybe there's we should a... we should hear him out. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, seems like at a certain point he was uh, he was ready to fight. Uh, metaphorically or literally <laughs> fight anybody and everybody in that company. Uh, um, so doesn't seem like a situation that could have, uh, that could have lasted uh, much longer given, given the state of, of everything. So uh, yeah, it's a, it's a weird thing. Cause as you talked about, there were a lot of, a lot of good matches, some great promos, including, as you mentioned, that debut is, incredibly in in, i don't like using this word because people use it on twitter too much but iconic like that's an iconic moment in pro wrestling history to me is is punk coming back um and and two years later he kind of leaves as a at best he is a uh you know uh of a tweener (laughs) but to most people he he leaves the villain he he leaves as a uh you know as as everything you know he cut he came in and everything you know tried to change the culture of a place that people seemed pretty happy with at least as far as the fan base went and again it's not as if he doesn't still have friends there he clearly does um but it's just people look at him as a guy who you know will we look at punk in AEW the same way we look at hogan and tna i don't think so because you know, Punk wrestled and had good matches and cut good promos. Uh, so, but it, it does feel like that kind of thing of just like a guy came in, they tried to build everything around him. They tried to, to an extent, change the entire vibe and direction of the promotion to suit his whims, at least for a time. And it 
it for some people, for some fans of the of the original company, uh, it cha- it just was too much, and it it changed too much about what the core of what they liked about the company was. So, yeah, it's you could you could quite literally write a book probably just about the last two years of his career, um, and and what it meant and what it could have meant and what it could have been more and could he have played nicer and all that like there's a lot of uh stones that probably will will remain unturned again unless there's subpoenas and depositions (laughs) uh involved so yeah it's it's a weird kind of a bummer note to go out on but also you know if you if you want to look glass half full he who thought he would come back at all (laughs) you know yeah and uh, and and he did some good stuff along the way, and hey, maybe now he'll go and do like a Saudi show, and wouldn't that be funny? <laughs> it it would be. Um, as far as where he goes next, if he goes anywhere next, um, as we mentioned, it kind of depends on. Um, Tony Khan was asked to whether he would have a non compete, and uh, he visibly grimaced. And uh, responded that he is not a lawyer who could interpret contract language. <laughs> so, to me, that sounds like he probably doesn't have a non compete. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how you can enforce a non compete unless you were giving the guy all of his money. And if you were not trying to save the money, you wouldn't. You would just pay him to go home. You wouldn't. Mm-hmm fire him for cause so to me i don't know how you can enforce a non-compete so i don't think there's a non-compete but that's just me uh, i am not a contract lawyer mm-hmm. uh but uh now he has uh, no leverage right <laughs> it's like right he goes to wwe uh, they get to decide whether they want to work with the problem child mm-hmm. right and they apparently didn't want to work with him before I, I i i don't know like time heals all wounds etc etc cliche 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 mm-hmm. um the very petty vince mcmahon and paul levesque <laughs> now must decide um whether or not they want to work with with cm punk and I, I i don't see it i just don't see it they don't need it i i, I was gonna say that's a big thing there was a time when <laughs> wwe's business and any upticks in it as far as like ticket sales and television ratings was entirely tied to who they could get to come back. Yes. Um, for several years there, um, it was all about debuts and returns still is to an extent, but um, you know, they still build it around part-timers to an extent, but not to the degree that it was. And punk was one of the last guys you could have brought back. Um, and apparently Fox did push very hard to get him for them to try to sign him in uh, whenever he was doing the show or whatever, the, uh, the, the Fox sports show with, with Renee and all them. So uh, feels like his window where WWE would have, where WWE would have eaten crap to get him back is over. And now he'd need to be the one <laughs> to, uh, you know, to make some concessions. If bend he, the knee. Right. And and we know, if there's one thing we know about Vincent Man, he <laughs> loves a guy who told him to F off and, and I'll never work for you again coming back. He loves to get that guy. He'll give Punk the biggest hug when he walks he, in. That is true. He loves he relishes getting that guy back those guys back under contract, back under his control. Um mm. does That's Paul point. does Nick I mean Nick Khan wasn't there when the original blow up happened? Does Nick Khan care about that? Probably not. Nick Khan's too busy, you know, making deals with Snickerdoodle with uh, with Snickers or Cinnamon, Cinnamon Toast, Toast Crunch. Crunch. Yes. Uh, the thing he, about the thing about Nick is he's tight with Ariel Hawani, who's tight with Punk, or at least was at one point in time, mm-hmm. and is part the Punk and Hawani are probably both uh, pretty firmly in the anti t- uh, Tony Khan camp at this point. <laughs> so, I think in that regard, it, it, the the powerful the the most powerful guy in WWE right now is probably t- Nick Khan, mm-hmm. and he pro- Punk probably has the right friends in in, in that instance. 
that's a good point. Yes, and uh, Nick, 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 uh, Nick getting involved is probably his uh, his best shot. Uh, but again, it uh, it all it all depends on does he need the money? <laughs> does he want to go back? Does he want to wrestle? If he wants to wrestle, right. it's not going to be it's not going to be for Impact. <laughs> Uh, it's, you know, it's, he's not getting, he's not getting in the ring for, you know, high six figures or low seven figures, you know, like, right. so, um, are yeah. they throwing out, are they throwing out edge deals anymore? <laughs> I don't uh, know. Apparently not, at least not to edge. Um, right. but would they, for a returning guy like punk, maybe we'll maybe after the merger goes through, which we can. Murder goes through on Tuesday, so right. so will the piggy bank be open then, or will it be? Will the purse strings be held tighter? That's these are all factors that play into into this. But yes, it does feel like, to your point, in the immediate, WWE is doing great in every metric. Yep, <laughs> and is bringing a guy in that could potentially make a lot of people unhappy. Um, is that worth? Is that worth it at this time? Or, you know, if in 18 months business is down and, you know, Cody ain't drawing the houses he's drawing now and whoever else isn't, isn't, you know, the Judgment Day stuff isn't so hot or when we're in year 18 of Roman Reigns' title reign and you need a guy, sure, maybe we look at it then. But right this second, it's it's hard to make a case that WWE needs this guy for uh, for any any reason. I I would bring him in. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, again, I would too because the funniest possible <laughs> ending to this story is him wrestling like Logan Paul on a show in in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Like this is that's my dream match at this point. Sure, I would bring him in. I would put him in the Royal Rumble, right? Mm-hmm. I would uh, I would have security guards like Goldberg, uh, except for a shoot. <laughs> I would have security guards posted outside his door. I would have them walk him to the ring, walk him back to the ring. I would only communicate with him uh, like via via email mm-hmm. and uh, give him his creative via email. And uh, he could work out his match with whoever by uh, by video chat or by uh, by email. And uh, and that's it. Other than that, I would keep him sequestered in in a room backstage. I think I would use him like I I would put him in the Rumble. I would probably job him out to Roman at WrestleMania, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'd probably use him four times a year. Um, and he would kind of the way they used Edge, but I I would have him win a little bit more probably. Um. But and then I would do that for three years, and then he could go home. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I I definitely think that if if I don't see him coming back to WWE full time, and like and not you know not not he's not working, he's not working Poughkeepsie, <laughs> he's not working the Seth Rollins towns, you know. He's he he got hurt a lot working once a week mm-hmm. for AEW. <laughs> so yeah. There's diminishing returns there, too. right? Yeah. So, and 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 to his credit, he did wrestle a lot this summer, and he seemed to hold up okay. But uh, still yeah, once a week, but still, <laughs> that's true. And <laughs> and uh, and uh, he may have held up physically, but <laughs> he did choke a man <laughs> directly after his final wrestling match. So yeah, yeah, um, that's true. Uh, and who knows what physical wear and tear. Before his final oh, wrestling match, before that's right, <laughs> yeah, it was almost after, but I guess uh, Joe Joe uh, convinced him to go yeah. out for it. Yeah, um, yeah. So I, I definitely, I could see yes, a part time WWE stint for him coming in for the big shows, which at this point are WrestleMania, the Rumble, SummerSlam, and the Saudi shows. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I could see him coming in on that sort of yes, and being used on that sort of uh, sparing, like like Logan Paul Edge schedule, like you said. That would that would probably be the best way for him to be utilized, and as you said, uh, the best chance to minimize uh, <laughs> any of the uh, damage. Yes, <laughs> fighting. <laughs> yeah, him him and Seth would be a nice pro- be a nice program. 
Mm-hmm. Him and Cody would be a nice program. Mm-hmm. Him and Roman would be a nice program. Mm-hmm. There's a year. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's probably two years, but yeah, there you go. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of reasons this could work out. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway. Yep. Yeah, so farewell. See you. Um, we hardly knew you. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait till you're back in the news again. You were great for business. Oh man. It really was. Um, so AEW uh, collision, they fired him right before collision. They dressed the firing on collision. As soon as they fired him on TV, 90,000 people turned <laughs> tuned out of the show. <laughs> and uh, the final uh, segment there of collision was watched by somewhere around 200,000 people, which is just a frightening number. Uh, yeah, it was, up, it was up against WWE pay-per-view, but still. Yeah, that's that's astronomically low. <laughs> like, <laughs> Like Rampage going against like the NBA finals didn't do didn't go that low. No, it's real bad. Real bad number. But uh, they were up against WWE, but they had their own pay-per-view. I guess we'll just go ahead and go through this. Most people really loved All Out. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't have a whole lot of bad things to say about it. Yeah, it was very very I really enjoyed I really enjoyed much of it. Most of it. Yeah, I thought every everything Oh, I, a lot of stuff over delivered like like Miro and Hobbs and uh, Darby versus the Luchasaurus uh, so that stuff over delivered and then the stuff you thought would be good uh, was good so it was a very easy to watch show and uh, I didn't I didn't necessarily feel the length of it the way I feel the length of uh, of some AEW pay-per-views yeah, they went like four hours and 47 minutes or something, uh, including the pre-show. Mm-hmm. 13, 13 matches, Battle Royal, hang, Hangman won, gave his money to Chicago Public Schools. That was nice. Mm-hmm. Kara Shida, Will Nightingale, Sky Blue beat the ROH contingent of Athena, Mercedes, Martinez, and Diamante, the... I guess it's the ROH slash collision contingent there. Mm-hmm. Um, the acclaimed retained the six man tag titles um, thanks to uh, Dennis Rodman. Naturally. Yeah. Uh, Rodman. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. They got six minutes on the pre show. That's, that's probably about right. <laughs> um, Cole and MJF retained the uh, ROH tag titles. Uh, Samoa Joe beat Shane Taylor in a match. I don't. They went six minutes. I don't know why this. Why I don't know why they bothered. Uh, Luch- so, Sorry, so that Joe could shove MJF on his way to the ring. <laughs> yeah, it was an angle. <laughs> it was an angle. Uh, Luchasaurus beat Darby. Luchasaurus and Christian are on a nice little run here. Uh, Miro beat Hobbs, and uh, hot and flexible Mrs. Meat debuted. <laughs> um, look. Lana slash CJ Perry was an AEW. I kid you not. <laughs> For 20 minutes. And they shot two segments where this woman was barefoot. Someone there is a foot guy and a pervert. Free will. All right. Uh, CJ Perry in on a short, short-term basis, apparently. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know what you're doing. You talk about guys that make up stuff in your, in their head. Yeah. Miro, one of those guys. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of a lot of Miro lore. Yes. Like he doesn't like his wife anymore. And <laughs> and like at first I thought, are they playing off the d- divorce angle in WWE? Right. Which maybe they are, but the announcers didn't realize that. <laughs> that was right. the case. Plus, I feel like he's Prior to this version of Miro, the like the TNT champion Miro was talking about, you know, how much he liked banging his hot wife all the time anyway. So, yeah, felt like we we moved on from that. So I don't I I don't know. I don't know what the I'm just I'm I'm unclear as to what what Miro lore we are missing with the inclusion of CJ Perry. Yeah, they didn't really follow CJ Perry. Yeah, they haven't really followed up on it yet either. So we're left in the dark. Uh, Chris Statlander beat Ruby Soho to retain the TBS title. Um, Tony Storm. <laughs> Everyone loves what Tony Storm's doing right now. The Outcasts breaking off from the Outcasts doing this. 
a Hollywood starlet from the 40s thing. It's tremendous. <laughs> it's absolutely tremendous. She's out of control. Like, like, <laughs> like her husband. Yes. She understands this business. Yes. And that what, you, what people want is for you to be an absolute goddamn weirdo. <laughs> Just a big weirdo freak. And her version of that is to be a 1940 starlet who throws shoes at, at announcers <laughs> and walks around in a bathrobe. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I love it. It's incredible. <laughs> it's absolutely incredible. Oh, man. All right. Uh, Brian Danielson was the surprise, uh, not Ricky Steamboat. Um, they did a cute angle on collision where Ricky Starks agreed to a strap match with the dragon like a freaking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> and then the dragon turned out to be the American dragon and not uh, the 70 year old Ricky Steamboat. Uh, Danielson is back. It makes you wonder if he could have made all in at this point, considering mm-hmm. he wrestled seven days later. Um, he said in the press server there was smoke and mirrors and he wasn't really using his right arm. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, but he and uh, Ricky Starks had a strap match. And I would say that the final four match run of this five match run of this show. Um, ugh. I think I disagreed a little bit with anyway. Most people seem to really enjoy the last five matches on this show. Mm-hmm. And we're like, this put put this in all time or pay-per-view. Uh, territory and um, as with most Brian Danielson matches as I said to you off the air uh, <laughs> this crossed the line for me in, uh, into being uh, too real <laughs> for me for me to enjoy as he and Ricky Starks beat the crap out of each other with a strap uh, but most people enjoyed it but did you enjoy it? Uh, yeah it was uh, it was awesome it was violent it was bloody um, it's the only good strap match I think I've ever seen. <laughs> um, other than maybe the strap match he had with uh, May He Rest in Peace with Rotunda in the Fiend gimmick. Somehow sure. he had a good strap match with the Fiend. Um, but like to me, the only way any of these types of matches where the guys are tied together, whether it's a chain or a dog collar or this, is if you just beat the tar out of each other and bleed. And that's what they did. And uh, yeah, thought it was incredible. Ricky Steamboat's out there bumping on the floor for Big Bill. Yeah. Uh, just a wild, a wild uh, set of events there. But uh, yeah, I thought it was, uh, I thought it was incredible. And uh, yeah, Brian Danielson's one of the greatest who's ever lived. And Ricky Starks needed, I think, I think if there's a critique of Ricky Starks, it's that, he hasn't had like the big match performance to this point in his career. Um, and he had that here with, with Brian Danielson and he was very good in this match as well. Um, so yeah, awesome, awesome stuff. Uh, one of, one of, uh, I, it, it's very violent. Like it was, it definitely crossed over some of the strap shots themselves. Um, definitely came close to my line as well of like oh oh my goodness (laughs) of remember this is fake guys but uh yeah like i said i think that's kind of in my brain and clearly in the brains of these two guys the only way to make this match not suck is to just kill each other and that's what they did uh bcc beat kingston and shibata Uh, i didn't need it at this point in the show but most people loved it uh, Takeshita beat Kenny Omega. They went over a half hour. A little long for my taste, but mm. uh, Takeshita gets his first big singles win. Yeah, it feels like they've maybe reheated Takeshita a little bit after felt like he was really, really over as a heel coming out of that turn with him and Don together. And then he just was kind of on the back burner as the Elite feuded with uh, the BCC for a while. So this felt like the last two, the, he pinned Kenny in the six man at the, at all in, and then he gets the big clean win at the, at all out. So it feels like maybe we've gotten, we've gotten back on track with uh, Takesh as a, as a, as a big top heel now. Can I tell you the problem though? <laughs> That's that? always what I'm here. And I don't mean Marina Shafir. <laughs> Takesh, uh, the problem here is that, uh, 
Tony's got uh, a world title tournament going on. Uh huh. That either uh, Samoa Joe or your friend Roddy Strong is going <laughs> to win. Um. So one of the that's that's something that's going on. And then whether Joe or Roddy wins the tournament, the next challenger for MJF will be whoever it isn't. So the next two world title challengers are Roderick Strong and uh, Samoa Joe. Um, Takeshi at nowhere near that top mix. <laughs> he just I... beat he just beat Kenny Omega. We are months and months away from this push for Takeshi to ending up meeting anything. So, and I have no faith that they will keep his momentum over the next several months. Yeah, I don't I don't disagree. I think you're right. I mean that I yeah, I'm glad you brought up the tournament because that bracket is like preposterously <laughs> bad to me. Like just from a booking standpoint, like who's in it, who cares? Like we know it's either going to be Joe or Roddy, like you said. But like every Almost every guy in the tournament either lost at All Out or wasn't on the show. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was Penta, Jay Lethal, Jeff Hardy, Samoa Joe, um, and then Roddy and Trent Beretta mm-hmm. and Darby and Nick Wayne. Right. <laughs> so it's guys who either are coming off of losses like Penta and Jay and... Uh, <laughs> Actually, all of, pretty much all of them are. <laughs> Joe, Joe, Jeff Hardy, right? Joe lost at at uh, All In, and then and then or yeah, yeah, lost it all in yeah. and won it all out. So yeah. he is at least he at least won at the pay per view. Trent got thrown out of a battle royal on the pre show. Yeah. Uh, Penta lost to Orange and then wasn't on the pay per view. Um, Nick Wayne has never won a singles match on Dynamite, to my recollection. Uh, I think he. I think he beat. Uh, maybe he did. Maybe. Maybe not. I, I think he won a tag. He beat Ar Fox okay. in the tag. Okay. Um, I, th- but, I think you're still right then. Okay. Um, and then Darby coming off getting demolished by the Luchasaurus. Um, I don't know. And, and some of them you could be like, well, its career win loss record is strong enough, uh, or they're a big star. But like, what's Jay Lethal doing in this tournament? <laughs> Yeah, like, I don't know. <laughs> right. Why isn't I don't know. Jay White, uh, you know, the Bullet Club guys pinned pinned the elite two weeks in a row. Like why or beat the elite in two straight matches and the world tag team champions. Dax pinned MJF in a tag match two months ago. Why isn't he in this tournament? Not that I need more Dax Harwood on my show, but like he sure. should probably be in it since he since he pinned the world champion. Um I don't know. It's just yeah, this that bracket when I looked at that thing, I was like, what what am I looking at here? What like other than that, well, we know it's gonna be one of these two guys, so the matches don't matter that much. But then why do a tournament? Why don't you just say it's gonna be Joe or it's gonna be gonna be Roddy? And also it bothered me because Max uh made a big point of being like, Oh, Joe, you're trying to provoke me so that you can jump the line and get a title shot. Like well, apparently it's not very hard to get a title shot, so I don't know why Joe needed to provoke MJF to get one. Why didn't he just 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 get one? <laughs> He's also in the tournament. <laughs> right, which also didn't make sense to me. Like, if he wasn't in the tournament, right, and, and so he was trying to get a shot, that would make right. sense. Right. But then he's just like, well, I'm just fine. I'll just enter myself in the tournament. Oh, you could just enter yourself? With apparently. Him, take a number, and <laughs> the first eight guys or whatever that took him got, got in the tournament? I don't know. It's just when you do stuff like this, you just open yourself up to me. It's just too easy to pick apart. <laughs> yes. Like, like it's, and also like, why, why do it? Why do a two week tournament? What's the point? Other than that, Tony loves booking tournaments. Wrapping up all out bullet club gold, uh, beat FTR in the young bucks. Uh, I th- again thought this was a little long. But mm-hmm. uh, but uh, most people seem to enjoy it. Chicago then, got all of their uh, their punk fervor out in this match. They loved Kenny. They loved the Hangman. They let the Bucks have it. <laughs> couldn't happen to nicer guys. Uh, Moxley beat Orange Cassidy to win the international championship in the main event. John Moxley bladed Orange Cassidy. Mm-hmm. 
the this was uh bloody and violent and um I thought better than most bloody violent John Moxley matches. Well yeah, and I, John didn't bleed. <laughs> like uh orange, orange bladed and he bled everywhere. Um so it was it was unique in that way. Um yeah, I thought it was really good. It was deserving. It felt like a big time main event uh between two stars in this company that people cared about. Um, and I thought they did again, week one follow up is not as hard as like week six or week eight follow up as we as you just sort of laid out with Takeshita. Um, but week one follow up for Orange post this match, I thought was was solid to keep you keep you in mind. And as mentioned, you've got you've got the Arthur Ashe Stadium show, you've got a pay-per-view in October, you've got a pay-per-view in November. You can definitely build back to Orange and Moxley again with Orange getting the win this time, if that's what you want to do. All righty, let's uh, move along here to WWE. Uh, let's start with Payback, and we'll work backwards on this show because that's what they should have done. <laughs> uh, Seth Rollins beat Shinsuke Nakamura in a match that uh, Wikipedia says went 26 minutes. Um, yeah, Nakamura hasn't been a good wrestler in a long time. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, you know, it's been many years. It's yeah. been many, many years. It's been a very long time. And this Seth, is... Seth tried. This program must continue. Correct. That's that's the worst part of this to me <laughs> is is that for some reason there this is a that's a very like spinning your wheels 2017 WWE move to just just have them keep feuding the next night yes Rhea Ripley beat Raquel Rodriguez to retain the women's world championship Wikipedia says this went 17 minutes uh, about 16 minutes too long Uh, (laughs) and again this program must continue they're rematching on Raw this week so (sighs) yeah Yeah. not a lot of good things to say about the end of this card Mm -mm. Uh, a street fight for the tag titles Uh, Finn Balor and Damian Priest beat Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn Uh, most people really went gaga for this and I thought it was a fun house show match with the exception of Kevin Owens doing a swanton bomb uh, like out of the the audience on through a table or whatever he did Uh, I thought that was uh, uh, a good spot but uh, I thought it was a fun house show match yeah, it was good. It was it was wild, and, and there was plunder, and there was everything you want from a, a WWE weapons match, but it's not a match I'll remember next week in all likelihood. Yeah, Rey Mysterio beat Austin Theory to retain the United States Championship. I was surprised by the result, because I'm usually surprised anytime Rey Mysterio wins a match. <laughs> Austin Theory. Can't figure out what they're doing with him. Uh, yeah, he's... <laughs> Remember when they had John Cena point out everything that he's bad at? Yeah. And then they had a yeah. bad match at WrestleMania. Yeah. Yeah, they sure Good did. Times. Good times. John was on this show as the uh, guest host and as a guest ref for LA Knight versus The Miz, which went 15 minutes and 45 seconds, according to Wikipedia. And who uh, oh boy, <laughs> about 14 minutes and 45 seconds too long. Yeah, like. I, I think even the most fervent fans of LA Knight and The Miz would say that uh, this this match was not built to uh, accentuate their positive qualities. Why um, would you book these guys to go sixteen minutes? Great question. Like, what, what? It's like it's a it's a it's a Peacock show. It's not like you have time constraints where you had to f- fill for time, right? Um. Uh, yeah i don't know it wasn't it wasn't good uh but uh you know la Knight is on the come up miz is uh seeing his life flash before his eyes in wwe right now so uh it was like it's not the worst match i've ever seen it just wasn't good (laughs) sure um the show opened with the main event uh becky lynch beat trish stratus in a cage match one of the best cage matches I've ever seen. I would put it up there with the Young Bucks against the Lucha Bros cage match. Mm-hmm. Actually, that was the best cage match I've ever seen. 
um becky and trish maybe top three cage matches i've ever seen but they killed it they were so great trish trash is 47 years old and has had like two singles matches in the last uh 17 years (laughs) yeah these two the pace they work their cardio i'm not exaggerating they work like Ricochet and Osprey in there together. The pace, not the moves. Right. The pace. The cardio pace they move is unreal. Great match. Great, great match. Give these women their flowers. Absolutely. And to be fair, as someone who was less enthused with, <laughs> Tri- with, with Trish's in-ring run of this up to this point, uh, I was blown away. I thought it was fantastic. Um and I'm glad they got to end a feud that I'll be nice and say had some ups and downs <laughs> over the past like five months that they've been feuding, seemingly. Uh, I don't think it's actually been that long. It was after WrestleMania, right? So, I mean, we're in the first week of September yeah, and this started great. basically on the Raw after or the, the, the second Raw after Mania. Right. So it's basically been five full months. Yeah. Right. So. <laughs> Given given all of that, there was a lot working against them, given that, as you said, Trish is uh, closer to 50 than 40, and and they're doing a cage match, which WWE cage matches are not usually good. Yeah. Uh, they killed it. It was, it was awesome. And yeah, it's absolutely... I'm, I'm glad for them that they got to kind of end it on a high note. And uh, and they went all out for it as as they should have. This is what a big feud ending grudge match should feel like, and and they pulled it off. So uh, kudos to both of them. And uh, I guess this this appears to be it for Trish. Then she they they immediately had at pulled the trigger on Zoe turning on her. So that's done with. Yeah. And I mean I mean I'm sure she might pop up for a Royal Rumble or something again. But it feels like this might be. Uh, might be it for her as uh, at least for this run. She's still in the raw intro, and uh, they shot a new raw intro for this week, and she's still in it. And uh, I didn't get the the uh, sense that uh, they're blowing off. I mean, they start, they moved Zoe like into a tag team with Shayna Baszler on Raw, <laughs> so I I don't know that uh, I I don't know for sure. I don't know exactly. Uh, but uh, I didn't get the the sense that this was like Trish's last match or anything. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't necessarily expect her to be a weekly character, but I also don't think like this is the end of the run. So there that's you go. fair. You got you got you know you still got Survivor Series and other big shows, and so yeah, she could still be. Around. I hope and I hope she is. Like I hope she she should get to keep doing this as long as she wants. Like. Like I said, even I, you know, I think she she's earned that, especially with with the last match. So, yeah, be, may, I mean, maybe now that they've put Zoe in a tag team, maybe Trish will get a partner and uh, and uh, and and that'll be the the feud going forward or something. But hey, we'll see. Sure. Uh, Jey Uso inexplicably moved to Raw after being out of WWE for like two weeks. Mm-hmm. Cody um, brokered a deal, but somehow yeah. it's a trade, even though he quit. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. This isn't good. This isn't good. This tells me they have no idea what they're doing with the bloodline. And uh, their idea for the bloodline now is to split them onto two shows. <laughs> and <laughs> I I don't know. It doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't make any sense to me. People go crazy for Jay, though. So good. And uh, all right. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see where this goes. Mm-hmm. Um, NXT. Um Braun Breaker <laughs> apparently killed Von Wagner <laughs> during this week's episode. So they cut away. They they faded to black. They did like the, the Sopranos ending with uh, Braun smashing Wagner's head with steel steps. They didn't show you the steel steps shot. They cut. They cut to black. And apparently, it's a. It was uh, uh good for them that they did that because. Apparently, Braun accidentally like graped this guy's head <laughs> with the steel steps. He was supposed to like work a step shot somehow. I don't know how you're supposed to do that and still make the sound. By the way, I like it feels like there's bad 
bad planning here. But then I heard that he uh, he actually like squished this guy's head. <laughs> so that seems bad. And um, against, I, I imagine like if you hit, like if you turn the steps upside down and you like hit the lip on the top uh, against the top, maybe there's like a little crevice where you could put somebody's body or head. But also you picked the man with the biggest head I've ever seen. And maybe that, maybe the measurements were off <laughs> given the size of his giant head. And maybe they shouldn't have done this. <laughs> That's possible. That's possible. We also have, uh, let's see, what do we have here? Um, lastly, coming up this week on NXT, Becky Lynch is working in NXT again. Um, they've been, uh, they spent a couple weeks building with her and Tiffany Stratton. Tiffany Stratton called her a bitch and said, see you next Tuesday, which is a fun acronym. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh, yeah, so Becky's going to challenge for the NXT Women's Championship on this Tuesday's episode, as you said off air, God bless uh, rights renewal uh, season. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, this, I mean, you just stay winning, right? Like, just going right from a Becky Trish feud to a Becky uh, <laughs> Tiffany Stratton feud. This is, uh, everything's, this is coming, tremendous. everything's coming up, Ethan, <laughs> this, this summer in, in the World Wrestling Federation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you go from, uh, Last generation Trish Stratus to uh, this generation Trish Stratus, you know, <laughs> Tiffany Stratton. It's uh, she is going to take the uh, the the ratings for this program straight to the tiffy top, and then uh, once she's there, she will say toodles. Uh huh. She's great. She, she is... has the the prettiest moon salt ever. <laughs> That's right, and she does differentiate hers because she starts on the bottom rope instead of the middle rope, so. It's it's not quite the uh, the seat the the Christopher Daniels one, but uh, so I, I think it even looks I don't know it, like there's like an extra step, but somehow that makes it better to me. Like, I think like there's like an extra flourish to it, but yeah, like I haven't seen as much of Tiffany Stratton as you have. I, I famously don't watch NXT <laughs> except yes. for their pay per views sometimes, but yeah, I mean you you can you can just absorb clips of her on social media and see like this person unless something goes terribly wrong <laughs> which we all saw what happened to mandy rose it's not impossible not that i think mandy rose was like a quarter as charismatic as tiffany stratton is but like there are certain people that you feel like are slam dunks in the world wrestling federation that uh, for whatever reason don't work out but it's like unless something goes terribly wrong she is you know she is probably good enough to work rest you know raw or smackdown tv now it's not like the in-ring uh standard for the women's division is that that high um i think she could be and probably it's better maybe for her to stay down on nxt where she gets to do like more different types of feuds and things and vignettes and things that they don't really have interest in doing on the main roster um but yes she's she's good and unless something goes horribly wrong she's gonna be an absolute superstar and uh charlotte should hire someone to break her legs <laughs> yeah yep there uh she's uh she's the replacement she's charlotte's replacement i hope charlotte realizes it mm -hmm. all right we've uh gone a long time here uh anything else you want to get into no, I think we've uh, we we've, we've run the gamut this week. <laughs> All right. Yeah, sounds good. All right. Till next time, everyone. I'm Ethan, and I'm Liam. Uh, we'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life. Bye bye. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. <laughs> Well, congratulations. You've been vindicated on hating Jimmy Fallon for the better part of a decade. You know, sometimes uh, the universe rewards you. <laughs>
some people deserve to have their faith rewarded as whichever Batman movie that is says that. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I just, I feel like anytime your entire like famous person persona is built around like uh, manufactured wholesomeness and like <laughs> being a nice guy, uh-huh. you are just, you better you better cover your tracks, man, because it's going to come out eventually. Like, it took, like, 12 years or whatever. People finally started saying stuff about uh, Ellen when her show was going off the air. Yes. People are coming for Jimmy now. I don't really think anyone ever came for James Corden, but he also just, like, retired (laughs) after, like, six years or whatever. So His staff never came for him, but there were many reports of him being an a-hole. That's true. I have seen like, uh, you know, was was like a bad person to waiters and such about him. Yes. Bad to waiters, mean to his wife on an airplane. Yes. But yes, no, uh, no reports of like horrible workplace environment on his show. So, which, uh, so it's like, you just, (laughs) when that's your whole brand, boy, you better be careful. (laughs) You either better make sure you're never, and that's the thing. If it was like it was one thing because a lot of the article is like talking about how there's been like nine showrunners and it's just kind of a bad environment from top to bottom. So you're like, okay, that's bad, but he's the host. He can play dumb and say, like, I'm just, you know, I just show up and do the show. But then there's like people be like, no, he berates staff like during tapings in front of audiences and celebrity guests. And you're like, ah, ooh, gonna be tough to <laughs> gonna be tough to come back from that one. Note, noted very questionable person Jerry Seinfeld comes out of the article looking like the good guy. He does. This is uh this is like the second time there's been like a Jerry Seinfeld Jimmy Fallon thing that's come out where Jerry looked good. There's I think there's a clip from his actual show where he was like I don't know if it was leading up to the writer's strike or something where he was just like you know, all these producers you have on your show, they don't do anything. They don't mean anything to this show. <laughs> and and Jimmy is just like sitting, sitting there impotently uh, <laughs> doing that smile <laughs> that Jimmy does. <sighs> it's like, yeah. And then there's this one. Yeah. So, yeah, just a, just a rough day at the office. Like, I don't know if it matters because like, if, will Facebook moms read this Rolling Stone article? Like whoever, whatever his target demo is, people who watch his <laughs> his uh, you know his little skits that he does on on YouTube. Like, is anyone that actually watches his show going to care about this? Probably not. Like he could probably he'll probably be fine. But I just hope it makes enough noise that he has to like tearfully apologize for it on the air. That's that's what I'm rooting for. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, a couple things about that <laughs> um, one here are my takeaways uh, first takeaway is that after like the 18th different article about toxic workplace culture at a television show mm-hmm. I am mildly suspicious of whether anyone who chooses to work on a television show is mentally stable or has ever had anything resembling a real job. Sure. <laughs> um, these are uh, not serious people, I think is my point. <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of people who went to a, who had a good school paid for a good education paid for and might be experiencing like having a boss. That's kind of what I'm getting at. Okay. There, yes. Uh, but I mean, that's not to absolve uh, the the host, <laughs> but also, uh, yeah, I'm suspicious of <laughs> toxic workplace cultures when it's only ever about television shows. <laughs> it's like, uh, how hard could your job getting coffee for Jimmy Fallon be? You know what I mean? <laughs> Like, wh- why do you require a crying room? <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, look, it's it's ideally no no workplace would be like that. But yes, there's probably yeah. something to that. And 
yeah, like I said, I th- I think the juicier stories are more, like you said, it's just that's that's just, whatever. It's the bonus section. Who cares? Right. Stocks barking. Um, right. uh, it, it's it's more the the personal interactions with Jimmy that went poorly, where it's like yes. that hurts him because yes. that, his whole thing is I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a charming little boy. And, <laughs> I'm the charming little boy of late night comedy and uh, and that guy can't turn out to be a dick and keep that right. persona. So that that's why it matters to me more so than just like, you know, the producers are, are mean because maybe just people that are producers are mean. <laughs> and like yeah. It seems, seems like a very common place. It doesn't mean it's right that they get, they get to do that. But yes, people in power quite often, uh, treat people below uh you know underneath them in the corporate structure uh very poorly it's that's not headline news yeah um uh, nine showrunners in nine years points to the uh the star being difficult to work with <laughs> uh yeah i like the, at one point there were three of them running it at once i'm like what do you what kind of clown car <laughs> setup do you have over there at nbc <laughs> Like, I don't know what a showrunner on a talk show does. <laughs> it's great question. You need a head writer. You need someone to be in charge of the writer's room. Mm-hmm. Uh, you need producers. I don't know why you need a showrunner. It seems like a superfluous position to me. But he, my other. T- he points to the guy who turns the applause sign on. I guess <laughs> my other takeaway from this Rolling Stone Rolling Stone article taking down Jimmy Fallon's toxic workplace culture <laughs> was um, uh, how they very not subtly inferred that Jimmy Fallon is an alcoholic mm-hmm. <laughs> by just linking directly to the like the the very tabloidy New York Post article from whatever that was like two years ago about it. Yeah, and talking about yeah. him slurring his speech in a. And smelling like alcohol in an elevator. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, again, I... I feel like that story's been out for years too. And it's just like, whatever. <laughs> well, I've, I forgot. I kind of forgotten about it, to be honest. But there's mm-hmm. a time there a few years ago where he like fell and broke his hand or mm-hmm. I don't know. Like there were several things where and he had to like issue a statement. No, I don't. No, I'm not an alcoholic. It's like, well, <laughs> that's that's something an alcoholic would say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for sure anywho there we go I try to keep on keeping on 